Yes, there is backlash when you go against the scientific community. There's absolutely backlash. Uh, uh, if they're younger professors, it is harder than if you're an older professor like me. But if they've done this to me to try to keep grants from getting to me and and you say, oh, you know, this is just conspiracy theory. This is not real. No, this is real. I've had two different people from two different federal organizations have told me in my office in person. They wouldn't even call me on the phone to say this, to say that that I've been excluded from grants. You, you, you might as well just stop trying to uh, uh, submit your grants there. You're not going to get funded. So just so that you know something about me, this is my family. Uh, I have four children. Uh, this is my daughter, Umbreen, and this is her husband, Philip. And uh, uh, they live in Israel. Uh, my daughter has lived there full time since 2006. Um, and, and this is my youngest son, Ben. Uh, he did uh, investment banking and then private equity, and now he's uh, gone back to school. He's getting an MBA. This is my wife, Shireen. We've been married for 40 years, 4-0, long time. And these are our grandchildren. Uh, this is, this is uh, Shiraz and Nava. These are the children of Ambreen and Philip. And this is my second daughter. She is uh, 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 Sabrina. She's an attorney in Houston, Texas. And this is my son, Josiah. He's a physician in Kentucky. So that's my family and I am just so blessed to have them. Okay, these are some areas of research that we work in. And uh, uh, so this, this is uh, where we learned how to make laser-induced graphene. And we learned that we can hit polyimide, a plastic with a laser and convert it into graphene. We can turn any solid carbon compound into graphene. This is not, this is not uh, 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 putting graphene on top of a piece of bread. This is converting the carbohydrate strands into graphene, where we, we, we uh, um, make these single atomic sheets of, of, of graphite. And, and this is a coconut that has been turned into graphene and we made a supercapacitor out of it. Uh, this is where we have carbon nanotubes and these carbon nanotubes can, uh, um, can be split and turn into nano ribbons. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. This is where we've made some computer memory. Uh, this is now in a public company called Webit. Uh, this is where we work in the area of traumatic brain injury and stroke. So we can make brains that would normally look like this and have them look more like this. Uh, we have carbon nanotubes interfaced with graphene, and we've turned these into battery electrodes. And uh, that's in a, a company right now uh, called Zeta Energy here in Houston. Uh, this is graphene quantum dots. If you there's a public company, it's in a public company now called dot uh, called dots D O T Z. Uh, we take plastics and we turn them into now CO2 absorbents. So this is really nice where we can take waste plastic and use it to, to capture carbon dioxide. So we take one problem to solve another. This is a, a big thing for us. This is in a company called, uh, by the way, this is in a company called now uh, H2Blue. This is uh, uh, in a company called Universal Matter. So you can go to universalmatter.com and learn more about this. But we can take any carbon material and put it across a high voltage and a high current. This is not a plasma, but an actual current. And we get graphene coming out. Uh, this is where we take nanocars. Uh, these are single molecule cars where, where these can rotate, these motors can rotate. These are Faringa motors uh, developed not far from where you are. Uh, and they will, they will rotate unidirectionally when we shine a light on them and, and drive this across a surface. And now we're using these to drill into cells like we can take super bacteria and just drill right through the cell walls and kill them. Uh, we've learned how to 3D print graphene and this is a, a rat which has had its spinal cord completely cut in two at the base of the neck, complete transection. Then we put one drop of a 1% solution of graphene nanoribbons in polyethylene glycol. And, and uh, after two weeks, the brain remaps the connections and it gets up and starts walking again. This is with a completely cut in two spinal cord. 
So, so this is this is something we can do. It scored an 18 out of 21 on a mobility scale, where 21 is is the the optimal mobility, uh, and that's after two weeks. And then you're going to see this transition uh, after three weeks. You see she's doing really quite well, and uh, a total recovery of a spinal cord that was completely cut in two. So that's the types of things we work on. Uh, Here's the, the companies that have started out of my group in the last seven years. Dots, which I told you about, and Webit, the silicon oxide the computer memory company. Both of these are now public. Zeta Energy for battery, NeuroCords for the graphene, nanoribbons for spinal cord repair, flash, universal matter for the flash graphene. Nanorobotics is doing the molecular machines drilling into cells. Zariant is a pancreatic cancer treatment. Uh, that's in phase two uh, clinical trials right now. Uh, LIGC is the one company that's working with laser-induced graphene, H2 Blue, the plastic. Uh, 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 we, we have a, a, another company called Texting Tips and Roswell. This is for DNA sequencing, DNA memory, just based on, on uh, um, molecular electronic memory. Rust Patrol, which is a corrosion inhibitor. Geronox, which is for traumatic brain injury, stroke, and dementia. And then the two other corporate vehicles. And we're starting four, ho hopefully four companies this year are going to start. We'll, we'll get those going. So that kind of gives you a background. Now, uh, I'm not going to mention God or gods in any of this right now. And so what I want you to think about here is that is that um, I don't need to mention God. I don't need to mention religion. I am just going to use science to critique science. Abiogenesis <clears throat> is the origin of life from non-living matter. <clears throat> it's the origin of life, life from non-living matter. To construct any convincing theory of abiogenesis, we must take into account the conditions, the condition of the earth about four billion years ago. So this is this is not my definition here. Here's the definition. It's coming from from dictionary definitions. Uh, for a synthesis to be categorized as being prebiotically relevant, it must use chemical reagents and conditions that are presumed to be available upon an early earth or accessible to an early earth. All right, it's not what can be done in the lab today, but it's abiogenesis is the origin of life from non-living matter. All right, abiogenesis takes place before biology, before biological evolution can begin. Hence, it is prebiotic or prebiology. Uh, what are the characteristics of life? Again, this is not my definition. The, these, these are others' definitions. It's responsiveness to the environment, it's growth and change, it's ability to reproduce, it's it, it has metabolism and it can breathe. It can maintain homeostasis, being made of cells and passing traits on to offspring. Uh, homeostasis is a steady state internal physical and chemical condition. Origin of life. Molecules don't care about life. Organisms care about life. Chemistry, on the contrary, is utterly indifferent to life. Without a biologically derived entity acting on, on them, molecules have never been shown to evolve toward life. Never. I don't care what anybody says. Show me where molecules have evolved toward life. We've never seen it. We've never seen it. it. Doesn't happen. Almost every chemical synthesis experiment on origin of life research can be summed up by a protocol analogous to this. You purchase some chemicals, generally in high purity from a chemical company, mix those chemicals together in water in a high concentration or in a specific order under some set of carefully devised conditions in a modern laboratory, you obtain a mixture of compounds that have a resemblance to one or more of the basic four classes of chemicals needed for life, which are carbohydrates, nucleic acids, amino acids, or lipids. Then you publish a paper making bold assertions, engage with the ever gullible press, and just watch the layperson say, wow, you see, scientists have understand how life formed. And then that encourages a generation of textbook writers to make colorful, deceptive cartoons that uh, uh, have nothing related to what the experiment was, where they'll show slithering creatures coming out of a prehistoric pond. But here's the synthesis problem. Molecules that compose living systems, molecules that compose living systems uh, always show homochirality, meaning they have non-superimposable mirror image. The vast majority of organic compounds are like this, unless you're very small, something like, something like, uh, uh, um, uh, acetic acid or acetone or water, those don't have chirality, but the vast majority of organic compounds have it. When building a molecular system, constant redesigns are needed. The synthetic reactions do not know how to stop their course of reaction. 
They, they'll just continue. There's no targeted goal. They don't know they're working toward life. They have no brain. Time, people say, is, is the great savior of abiogenesis. It is not. Compounds decompose. I've showed lots of data on my YouTube channels where you take the very experiments that these people are showing, and it decomposes very rapidly under the very conditions in which they make it. A prebiotic system does not have the ability to easy, easily purify structures. Reagent addition order is essential. The parameters of temperature, pressure, solvent, light or no light, pH, uh, uh, atmospheric gases or no gases have to be carefully controlled in order to build complex molecular structures. The characterization at each step is essential for chemists, but hard in a prebiotic system to consider because it is, knows, knows nothing of molecular structure. The mass transfer problem will be the killer of all roots. I mean, how do you take a little, uh, uh, even if you start with a ton of material, how do you move that along <clears throat> when each yield might only be a couple of percent? Now, all of a sudden, you're down to a few milligrams, and now what do you do? Nature keeps no laboratory notebooks, so it can't go back and get more material. Carbohydrates, which are sugars, saccharides, and they're polymers therefrom. So if you look at, 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 at uh, uh, these different, these are just the, the monosaccharides. Here are monosaccharides, all the different carbohydrates that you can deal with. And then here are the polysaccharides, only the homopolysaccharides. There are heteropolysaccharides as well. Uh, and so these, these, are, these are the things you have. And you can have all of these different structures. So these things are extremely complex. So if we just look at, at, at uh, uh, these, these different uh, uh, sugars, uh, you can see that, that you have one, two, three stereogenic centers. So you have two to the third possible isomers. So you have eight possible isomers. So you have eight possible isomers here. How do you get the one that you want and not the other ones? How, does, how is this done? This is hard to do. It's hard to control these things. And nobody, nobody has ever made uh, uh, carbohydrates in a homochiral pure form. Nobody's ever done it. And then if making them wasn't hard enough, you can never make the polysaccharides. Hooking them together is just as hard. How do you hook these things together? Even if you just have the dimer, here's the five possible reducing saccharides uh, of, of just this dimer, just this dimer of, of, of glucose, this dimer, here's all the different ways that it can be put together. Then if you look at the monomers, if it's in the open form, you have four stereogenic centers, that's 16 possible isomers. If you look at it in the closed form, it can have six membered rings, the alpha or the beta, or it can have the five membered ring, alpha or beta. So each has five stereogenic centers. So it has 32 possible isomers. So you, you got 32 times four plus 16, you have 144 possible isomers just from glucose. How do you get just one? You get the wrong isomer, the cell is dead, the cell can't live. Uh, these are hard, hard problems to deal with. Uh, if you look at polysaccharide systems, when you hook them together, cellulose has this 1,4 linkage where, where, where uh, this, this, these are beta linkages where they're coming up. That's cellulose. People don't generally eat cellulose for nutrition. They'll get cellulose for uh, uh, fiber. But for nutrition, we have to eat starch where this o oxygen is coming down at each unit here. And so when you look at starch, you see the oxygen unit comes down, but you have both the 1,4 linkage, the 1,4 linkage, and you have the 1,6 linkage. So you have 1,4 and you have 1,6. So you have at the 4 position or the 6 position. So you can have the 1,4 or the 1,6 position linkage. And so these are hard Hard to, to figure how can these things be made. And uh, uh, so now people who said that these were, these were simple to do, that, that uh, uh, they're tricky or something like that, now are conceding that, that no, you'd have to have enzymes to do this. So even those who are critics who said, who never said that you have to have enzymes are now confessing that now you have to have enzymes to do this because it's hard. Because if you just took, for example, uh, just, just the A base, say you, say you, you were making DNA, and you had A, 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 A. How, how could you hook this together? Just in one way. But if you had six D-glucoses, how many ways could you hook these together? Because they all have different branches. This can be below or above. These can be open to a five-member ring, 
Uh, so how many different isomers there are of D-glucose? So you just take the one in the antimer. How many different isomers of just the six units? Well, you can get you can get 10 to the 12th. You can get a trillion, one trillion different isomers on hooking these together. This is hard to figure out how to do. So that's why when we go in a lab to make these, you have to keep all of these other groups protected and do this very selective protection, deprotection to be able to do it. All right, so carbohydrate synthesis is exceedingly hard. Coupling is, is, is painstaking. The untrained have no idea how hard this is to perform. The trained remain clueless. The untrained, they see little difficulty. Peptides and proteins, which, which are made out of amino acids. So you have, you have your 20 common amino acids. Some of them have quite innocuous side chains and other, others of them have reactive side chains where when we make these, these have to be protected and they're all homochiral form. And so uh, all of these are active side chains that you would have to protect in order to do synthesis. That's a problem. How do you do this when you wanna make peptides? And everybody who makes these either uses the ones here that do not have any active side chains, like they'll say glycine, look, it works with glycine, but you've got to have all 20 of them and lots of these have active side chains. So they'll, they'll just ignore these, but nature doesn't have that, that possibility. These are hard to deal with. So when we do solid phase peptide synthesis, when we make these in the lab, you have to protect the side chain protection, that's SPG, and you have to protect the nitrogen group and then you load this onto a linker onto the resin from the carboxylic acid. Then what you do is you have to deprotect this nitrogen protecting group and then bring in the next amino acid with coupling agents to couple. They don't just couple spontaneously. And then you get the dimer and you get the tetramer and so on, the dimer, trimer, tetramer. And then you have to deprotect. See all these SPGs? These are all side, side, uh, 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 uh. These are these side chain protecting groups, these side chain protecting groups. These have to be in place. Nobody knows how this was done on an abiological, in, in, in a pre-biological pre earth. Nobody knows. All right, that's why it was published in Nature a few years ago by Matthew Pounder, who's an origin of life researcher. He says that it is inconceivable that these sophisticated and coordinated macromolecules suddenly emerge at the origin of life. And in practice, these things don't polymerize because they don't polymerize in water. Now, if you want to say, if you put a surfactant in there in water, well, now it's in a surfactant. It's not in, a, in water anymore. It is in a surfactant. It's in a hydrophobic pocket. You want to get these things to polymerize? You can, but only if you have side chain protection and only if you have synthetic activating groups. Show me this without synthetic activating groups and without side chain protection. It's unknown. It's unknown. It's not out there. Nucleotides, DNA and RNA. So for, for, for RNA, you have this ribose structure hooked onto a base. For DNA, you have the deoxyribose, one OH less. Uh, DNA is going to end up being much more stable than RNA. Uh, so when you make DNA in the laboratory, you have to you have to take you have to protect and activate different groups. Here you 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 activate with a DMT group. Uh, you're protecting this, then you deprotect this, and then you do this coupling. You have to take this phosphoramidite and you have to 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 couple this on. This is all human made stuff. Where you take this, you buy you, you what you'll get from from a natural system is is you will get the deoxyribose. And then you'll, you'll get the base from a natural system and you'll, you'll have this already in place, but now you have to activate it with this. You have to, you have to have this protected here. And, and uh, uh, so now, so that this free hydroxyl can attack that phosphorus, that's the coupling step. Now for all the ones that didn't grow, then you have to cap that off and then you do the uncapping and the coupling. And so you, and then you do the oxidation to take you to this, this uh, 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 from this phosphite to this, this uh, uh, derivative that is still protected. And then at the end, you have to cleave all of these. So there's a lot of work, and then this has to be cleaved off the bead and put through HPLC. 
Now, the problem with RNA and the whole RNA hypothesis is that RNA is not stable. It is not stable. That's the problem with it. Even Jack Sostek himself says you only have seconds to minutes to work with RNA at room temperature. Only seconds to minutes. That's it. Uh, because it's unstable, that's why you keep it at minus, minus 80, because if you don't, you get this intramolecular attack and it cleaves this. This is right off the website of the companies that sell this stuff. And uh, it cleaves, and this doesn't go back. This doesn't go back to RNA, that's it, it's broken. Lipids in the cell membrane. Some people think lipids are easy to make. This is what a lipid look like, looks like, where you have this ethanol amine hooked up to the phosphate group. Now you have a, a homochiral stereogenic center, and then you'll have this long aliphatic chains, two long aliphatic chains, one of them off a stereo center where you have this, 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 uh, 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 this glycerol type intermediate. The problem with this is, is the desymmetrization to get this homochirality. We don't know how to do that. Nobody knows how that was done on a prebiotic earth. And this has one stereogenic center. If you look at sphingiolipids, which are more advanced, they, they have four possible stereoisomers because they have two stereocenters. Uh, these will form where you have the hydrophilic groups facing water, and the hydrophobic groups to form a lipid bilayer here. And you have to put these through shear forces in order to get these in any reasonable yield. Uh, there's no control of the absolute stereochemistry. There's little to no control of the relative stereochemistry, little to no accounting of yield in prebiotic syntheses, little to no accounting of purification, no accounting for mass transport. There's enormous human intervention in every phase of the experiment. A prebiotic earth would have none of these luxuries. The origin of life researchers, those superb synthetic chemists, are generally silent on all of these questions. You read the articles and, and they leave enormous holes that, that are misleading to the non-synthetic chemist. This is not for lipids only. This is for almost all origin of life researchers' syntheses. All right. Chiral-induced spin selectivity, a big problem. You can't just say this is an esoteric thing. It is not. It's been known for about 20 years now. How do cells, why is it the chemistry in cells can stay so clean, so clean? And it's because you have electrons that are matched in their spin state. So you can have electron with a spin up or an electron with a spin down. When we do chemistry in the laboratory, we choose, we, we use both. Nature doesn't do that. In natural systems, you get an electron, it will single out an electron of one particular spin, either spin up or spin down, and it will select this and have it go down a chiral environment. When it goes down a chiral environment, where you had to have chirality before life ever started, then you can choose and get selective chemistry. If you can't get selective chemistry, if you get mixtures, life is never gonna start. You've gotta have high yield, and you look in any cellular system, it's high yield. You say, well, well, Simpler cells didn't have that. No, simpler cells are going to get gummed up the same way. You have to have chirality first, and that gives you control. So, for example, a, a hydroxyl radical can form hydrogen peroxide in an anti-parallel singlet surface or a parallel triplet surface. You can form oxygen. And so electron transfers, they go through chiral systems, and they will select only the electrons of the proper spin to go through the chiral system. And so... Plant cells survive by this method. This is, this is how all cells survive. But, but if you just look at photosynthesis, they have these long range electron transfers. You have to get the proper electron going in the proper direction. And that has to happen because you first have to have chirality in the system. Uh, scientists use pi conjugated molecules to uh, researchers are just beginning to understand these phenomena. You don't need pi conjugated molecules. You get electrons running through these, these long conjugated systems, these long non conjugated systems when you have a spin valve, when you cor correlate the right electron spin to the right chirality. Uh, a theoretical work suggests there can be several orders of magnitude enhancement of electron transfer in one direction over the other. So there's no evidence for acclaimed racemic mixtures, meaning no homochirality being used in cells. They've never been shown to function based on the reaction specificities, yield and heat management that would be needed for cellular systems. Vast numbers of electron transfers take place in lipid bilayer membranes, so it is baseless to summarily dismiss the need for lip lipid homochirality. And how do proteins noted above become homochiral when there is no prebiotically relevant route 
ever shown to make amino acids in homochiral form or to separate the enantiomers or to polymerize them. But like so much that is promoted by the, those speaking about the chemistry of life's origin, there, there are incorrect claims that make the chemistry of life appear easy. People will build what are called protocells. So they'll, they'll make this lipid bilayer with water inside of it, and they'll stick some molecules in there, and they'll say that this is a protocell, meaning that it is, it is a self-organized system that's a stepping stone to life. But there's no resemblance other than it's got this lipid bilayer, but there's no life there. And people will, will, will just, just uh, uh, blow these things up. Cellular membrane, membranes are highly uh, 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 exacting in their structure. You have to have a different cellular membrane on the inside than on the outside of the cell. We know how to do this, uh, and nature does this with, with something called flipase enzymes. But how do you do this before there's enzymes? And you have to have the proper proton gradients to be able to sustain life. And so all of these are big problems, big, big problems. And you have to have all these recognition elements on the surface of the cell. You may say, well, simple cells didn't need this. We'll show you how simple a cell can possibly be. Then there's the interactome problem. These are the non-covalent interactions, the non-covalent. So you can have the covalent bonded interaction or non-covalent interactions. Uh, uh, nobody knows how a viable cell emerges from a massive combinatorial complexity of its molecular components. Uh, um, and so if you just take a single yeast cell, a single yeast cell, and you only consider the protein-protein interactions, the alignment of these proteins with, with each other, you can align them 10 to the 79 billion different ways. Now, this is a really big number. All the elements in the universe, in the universe is 10 to the 90. This is 10 to the 79 billion. These are not my calculations. These are biophysicists' calculations. And so how do you get this? And in a living cell, when it divides, it takes this information and it cramps it down and pulls the cell apart like that. But how did this happen in the first cell? Nobody knows. Everybody wants to ignore this. You can't ignore this. They want to ignore uh, uh, interactomes. They want to ignore uh, uh, um chiral induced spin selectivity. You got to deal with it. You got to deal with it. Origin of information. Critical for life is the origin of information, DNA or RNA. The information is primary. The matter is secondary. We can't even get the matter, the requisite carbohydrates, nucleic acids, lipids, and proteins, let alone the information. Uh, try to build a cell hypothetically. Okay, so let's see what would it take to really build a hypothetical cell. So a dream team cannot make a cell living cannot make a cell a living cell if given all the chemicals in homochiral form and the informational code now you say well what about craig venter's experiment well what craig venter did in 2010 is he copied an existing bacterial genome and transplanted it into another cell that was already existing so what you can do is if i go out and i take the computer memory the computer operating chip out of my car and i copy that in my lab, in, in my clean room here at the university, if I were able to copy that and put it back into the car, would you say that I made that car? No, I just copied a piece and put it back in the car. But in 2016, what he did is he removed all but 473 genes from a natural genome and transplanted it into another cell. That's what he did. He didn't make the cell, he didn't make the interactomes, he didn't make all these chiral-induced spin selectivity things, didn't make any of that. In 2021, he added 19 genes back in to get it operating a little bit better so that it could reproduce. Okay, so I'd make a challenge. A Nobel Prize would probably be awarded if anyone could make a working cell. Not a complex cell, even just a simple, minimal cell that shows the functions of life. Okay. What do you need for functions of life? You have to have responsiveness to environment. Again, not my definition. Growth and change, able to reproduce, have a metabolism and breathe, homeostasis, this internal action, and being made of cells and passing traits onto offspring. That's what it has to be able to do. So if you want to have anything that looks like a biological cell, this is the minimal cell. So you say, well, cells were much simpler back then. They were just bacteria. Okay, well, and really simple bacteria. Okay, fine. Well, what would you need? 
some form of metabolism is going to be needed to provide molecular building blocks. Genetic replication is going to be needed. And you're going to have to have a boundary membrane. So you're going to have to have these three main features. We'll look at the details of this. The necessity of coordination between boundary fission and full se uh, uh, segregation of the previously generated twin genetic templates could be added to this definition. Another fundamental characteristic th that could be added to the es essential features of a minimal cell is the ability to evolve, which is a universal characteristic among all known living cells. We will make these two letters optional for this challenge. All right, so what's known? The smallest natural genome that we know of today uh, capable of autonomous growth or laboratory cultivation in pure culture and also in an identif a, a defined medium is M. gelatalium. Uh, it's a 580,000 base. That's 580,000 bases. Uh, so you, you have DNA that's 580,000 units long. The first theoretical minimum gene set was proposed by Mushkin and Kunin consisting of 256 genes. Later, one integrative study utilized a larger data set and included some other results, and they came up, you're going to need at least, 2, 200, at least 206 genes. Well, what is a gene? A gene is a distinct sequence of nucleotides forming part of a chromosome, the order of which determines the monomers in a polypeptide or nucleic acid, which a cell or virus may use to synthesize, uh, to synthesize what it needs for life. So you're going to need at least 206 genes. This is not 206 uh, nucleotides. This is 206 genes. So say, say each gene set may be hundreds of units long. And you need then 206 of these. So this is what you're going to need. And here's the minimal gene set. This is what you're going to have to have in your gene set. It's going to be, have to be able to do DNA replication, repair, restriction, and modification. It's going to have to have a basic transcription machinery, amino acyl tRNAs, tRNA maturation and modification, ribosomal proteins, ribosomal function, maturation and modification, translation factors, RNA de de degradation, protein processing, folding, secretion, cellular division, transport, and energetic and intermediary metabolism, glycolysis, proton motive force generation, pentose phosphate pathway, lipid metabolism, biosynthesis of nucleotide and cofactors. These authors did not include rRNA or tRNA genes, and they recognized that the basic substrate transport machinery could not be easily defined, not be clearly defined, even though this minimal cell would rely greatly on the import of several substrates, including all 20 amino acids, because it doesn't have any biological ability to make them. So you're gonna to have to have all 20 amino acids available to this thing. So th you have to have all these functions. All right, so you have to first make each one of the segments. You have to make sugars, which are the carbohydrates, amino acids, nucleotides, and glycerol. You have to make all four of these classes first. And remember, there are stereogenic centers you got, you, you got to account for here. How do you do this? And then what you have to do is, is you have to make these. So nobody's made these in prebiotic methods that are prebiotically relevant, particularly the sugars. They've made some amino acids. Uh, uh, they've found some of these things that, that have come in on meteorites. Uh, 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 Small, very small amounts of these with, with uh, very poor chirality, uh, uh, optical activities here. But nonetheless, we'll be nice. We'll just provide all of these. Okay, we'll give you all of these. Now all you got to do is polymerize these. Well, how do you polymerize these? Even detractors are saying, yeah, you got to have first have enzymes to polymerize these. So these we, we can't do. Peptides, how do you polymerize these? Nobody, nobody, nobody has shown the polymerization of of amino acids that bear reactive side chains. Nobody has ever done this in water, showing this that, and, and uh, in any prebiotically relevant manner without having to first protect these. How do you polymerize these? We don't know because you, you get swapping out where you get th these just break apart because of this, th th this attack. If you're gonna run on RNA, if you're gonna run on DNA, then, uh, then it's, it's a lot easier because you don't have this intramolecular attack. But again, it's very hard to make very long ones. And the lipids, how do you desymmetrize these? It's not known. But anyway, nice guy, I'll just give you all of these. I'll give you all of these. Give you all the amino acids, the nucleotides you want, glycerol, everything you want. I'll give you the carbohydrates, the peptides, the nucleic acids, and the lipids. 
in polymerized form of these, any sequence you want. So I'll even give you the informational code. You have everything. Now just go in a lab and make a cell. You got everything here. Can you do it? A Nobel Prize awaits you. Can't do it? Come on, a Nobel Prize awaits you. What's wrong? You're better than a mindless earth. So how do I know that we're, so, so, so no, nobody really knows how to do this. So nobody who's a scientist would say that they can take all these components and build a living cell. But somehow on an early earth that happened. Yeah, right. Okay, so I know we're nowhere close to being able to solve this because, because uh, 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 we, can, we can look at our progress relative to the target of making a cell. And what happens is the goalposts keep moving further away. They're not static. We just learned about chiral induced spin selectivity 20 years ago. That's the problem. We learned about this 20 years ago. And so, so then you see this ups the game. You have to, the cell has become much more complex than we thought. The interactome problem, which is the Leventhal uh, paradox 2.0, uh, is a real problem. How do you get these interactomes to align up? These are real problems. So the cell, every year, the cell becomes more complex. So it's moving further away from us faster than we are moving closer to it. So when people say things like researchers have solved the puzzle of the origin of life, that's an amazing claim. Um, but, but um, uh, you, you know, we don't believe it because you look at it and then you, you read the paper, you go back and, and go away from the news article to the actual paper. Don't send me news articles. If, if you don't say, hey, look in the news, it says this. I will read, uh, I'll delete it. Send me the actual paper. Send me the actual paper, because when you see the actual paper, you will see they didn't make any cell. They took a membrane and they just bought all these building blocks and they rammed it into here. But they have nothing. Nothing was building. And then they say they make the first cell. That's nonsense. All they did is they rammed it in here. That doesn't do anything. That's like having a car like this and saying you built this car. No, you, you can't just take all these parts and throw it in here and say that that's a working car. Okay. So the public is misled by this. How badly is the public misled? Uh, well, for example, a survey was conducted by John Narcom. He's a professor of marketing. And he asked the general public this. He says, under simulations of Earth's early atmosphere, scientists have mixed molecules together in laboratories to produce complex life forms such as frogs. Well, 37% of the people thought that was true. You say, who are these people? I talk about this on my YouTube video. These people were 80% of them had some college education. It went from associate's degree to PhDs. So 37% so thought this was true. Under simulations of Earth's early atmosphere, scientists have mixed molecules together in the laboratory and produced sing single-celled life forms such as bacteria. 68% uh, of the people thought that was true. Nowhere close, nowhere close. The first person who does this is gonna win a Nobel Prize. We're nowhere close to this. So this, the, the general public is misled. Okay, so have, have uh, uh, so-called scientific facts ever been wrong, be, shown to be wrong before? And the answer is yes, they've been shown to be wrong before. So for example, does the universe have a beginning? If you had asked scientists in the 1950s, most of them said, would have said the universe has no beginning. But then that fact, quote unquote fact, which was really a theory changed in 1964. Now the first suggestions of this were like in the 1930s, but uh, it wasn't really nailed down until 1964 with the steady state theory, which was, re which was replaced by the Big Bang theory, that the universe had a beginning. So, so scientists have been wrong before. Have they ever been wrong before in anything else? Yes. Darwinian theory to punctuate it in equilibrium. So the fact changed in 1972 when Eldridge and Gould proposed that the degree of gradualism commonly attributed to Charles Darwin is virtually non-existent in the fossil record, meaning that the fossil record shows nothing happening and then all of a sudden over short bursts of time, like say 100,000 years, large changes take place. So it's not the gradualism, so it went from Darwinian theory to punctuated equilibrium. That didn't change until 1972. Anything else? Yes, climate change was believed was ki would killed off the dinosaurs. That fact changed in 1980 when it became due to the asteroid impact. That's a new theories come up, the Alvarez hypothesis, that a 
iridium-rich al- uh, uh, asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula and threw up all this dirt into the air, which, which obscured the sun. So, so the plants died, so the herbivores died, then the carnivores died, and that's what wiped out the dinosaurs. So this quote-unquote scientific fact, which was just a theory, changed. Uh, how about random mutation and natural selection as suggested by Darwin and taught as fact are recognized by many evolutionists since the 1990s to be insufficient to account for the complexity of life. They say that neutral drift is quantitatively more important in understanding genetic differences between organisms. Neutral drift are the small changes in DNA between me and my children and them and their children. How long ago did dinosaurs become extinct? Or maybe better said, how stable is soft tissue? Well, the scientific fact is being questioned since 2007 when Mary Higby Schweitzer, a paleontologist at NC State University, led the group that discovered the remains of blood cells in dinosaur fossils and later discovered soft tissue remains of Tyrannosaurus rex specimens. In 2015, researchers reported finding structures similar to blood cells and collagen fibers preserved in bone fossils of six Cretaceous dinosaur specimens, which are approximately 75 million years old. So what is 75 million years old has retained organic structure where you have whole blood cells. We're not talking about fossilized blood cells, but whole blood cells. And, and, uh, and in, the, in the last six, seven, seven years, lots more of these. So how stable is soft tissue? There's a question there. Uh, it turns out to be a lot more stable than what we thought, or dinosaurs became extinct not as long as ago as we thought. And so there's a lot of questions out there. I hope you understand that what I did as I addressed science with science, I didn't invoke God into any of this. I didn't invoke religion into any of this. I didn't have to. I never spoke of God of the gaps. As a scientist, I would never say that we will never understand the origin of life. One day in the distant future, we might understand life's origin and evolution of complex systems. We don't understand that today. We might understand that one day. As a scientist, I could never say that we will never understand it. But if we do understand it, that doesn't lessen God. We'll just see him as all the more magnanimous. If you had asked somebody in the 1700s, why is it that, that if you have parents, two, two parents that are tall, their children are tall? I don't know. They, I don't know. Maybe God, God just does it that way. But now we know because of the structure of DNA from the 1950s and a lot of genetic work further since then, we know that that, D, that DNA is going to define height to the, in the sense that that DNA would be transcribed to RNA, the RNA to the proteins, which are the little nanomachines machines that build us. And so, so that doesn't make God less in our eyes because, because uh, we understand how it was done. In fact, I look at him and I say, you're, you're, you're amazing. I mean, this is amazing the way this is done. Okay, now, how about scientific facts versus the Bible? Well, as, as far as I know, there's never been a scientific fact that has been in controversy with the Bible. So, for example, a scientific fact is water, H2O. Now, you can have isotopomers, but it's still water, two hydrogens and an oxygen. You may have, you may have a, a, an H1, an H2, or an H3. You may have an oxygen 16, an oxygen 17, or an oxygen 18, but water is two hydrogens and an oxygen, and, and that is will be the same throughout the universe. That will never change. There's never been discordance between scientific facts and statements in the Bible, so there's no need to reconcile them. The so-called scientific facts, which are really theories, are constantly changing, even on the order of decades, and certainly on the order of a century. So trying to twist the Bible to fit scientific theories, frustrating endeavor. Don't let professors with their bold claims of facts upset you. Theories or conjectures are not facts, but unfortunately and shamefully, many (coughs) professors themselves do not make the necessary distinction. This leads to the confusion of generations of students and even professors themselves. Okay, so to the student, to the Christian student, this is to the Christian student who's inundated with misinformation. I have a word for you. It says in Deuteronomy 13, 3 and 4, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. 
The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere. Keep his commandments and obey him. Serve him and hold him fast. You're going to hear many things in your life presented to you by professors as if they are fact and they're not fact. You can ask, you can ask him or her to show, show you the facts. Where is that a fact? Not that that is consensus. Consensus changes all the time. The, the, the steady state approximation for the origin of the universe was consensus in the 1930s. Should we have gone with consensus? No. So, so uh, that was quite different. So let me just close with this because I was told that I could insert this and I want to do that. That uh, uh, There's this verse in the Bible it says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible cries out. He says, God speaking. He says, I, even I, this is God speaking. I'm the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. God will wipe them out. And Jesus further says in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And so come to Jesus. That is the message of the gospel. Come. Here's my last slide. Uh, you, can find, you, can, uh, 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 you can email me at, at drjamestour.org, uh, tour at drjamestour.org, and I give you an invitation. Uh, to anyone that does not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, hear how I became a believer. If you want to, if you want to hear how I became a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, I welcome you to send me an email, and I will share with you. We'll get together by Zoom, and I'll share with you. But this is not for believers. This is just for people who don't believe, and they want to hear why I believe. I'll give you that time. And, uh, 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 but you got to email me and ask me, and you can't email on behalf of a friend. That, that friend has to email me and make the request. And uh, you can see my, my YouTube videos at, uh, at uh, DR James Tour, okay? At DR James Tour. That'll work. And with that, I am going to figure, see if I can figure out how to stop sharing. Okay. All right. And Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Tour. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Great. I hear you. Great. All right. Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, we have quite a number of questions uh, coming in from the various uh, uh, platforms where people were watching the live stream. Uh, Dennis asks the question, and he says, a question from a brother here. Uh, could you please give an example of an irreducibly complex feature? Uh, that is understandable for everybody and not just for scholars. Yeah, so I never have used that nomenclature. That is the nomenclature of, of others use this idea of irreducible complexity. I've never used that. And what I find is that when people use it, you will always have somebody contest with it. So that's not a, that, that, that's not a, a uh, uh, you, you know, something that, that, that I push. I just talk about the complexity of the chemistry. Um, uh, so, so, uh, I'm familiar with the arg arguments that came out, which are 25 years old, more than 25 years old. And, uh, and the gentleman that first put forth those arguments of irreducible complexity, I know him, he's been to my home and, and, uh, but, but I don't use those arguments. So I'm, I'm not going to put those forward because that, that's not an argument that I use. And I don't like defending other people's stances. I completely understand. Um, so, uh, Chris Idema asks the question, uh, how are enantiomers separated in the lab? Okay, so there's multiple ways they can be separated in the lab. Once in a while, once in a while, they will, if you, if you crystallize them, you'll get one, one handedness is one set of crystals, another handedness is of another set of crystals that'll crystallize side by side, and they're slightly different in structure. And if you look very carefully, you can actually then then move those, separate them by hand once you, you filter them off. And that's, that's actually what, 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 what uh, was originally done with, with uh, uh, these carbohydrates by, by, uh, by Fisher and uh, uh, beautiful experiments. But that's rare. 
generally the way they're done, you can do it by chromatography where you have another chiral element acting upon it. So you use a chiral column. So when you go through a chiral column, now the two different enantiomers will react with that chiral column to form diastereomers. Then they will run through differently and you separate that them in that way. Or what you do is, is you derivatize them so that you derivatize them with another stereogenic center. So now the two what were two enantiomers become two different diastereomers, and now you can separate them by chromatography or by crystallization or by solubilization parameters, and then you take off the derivatizing group. I'm speaking a lot of high-level chemistry that I'm sure that many people can't follow, but there are multiple ways to do this in the laboratory. And there are natural means of doing it as well, but these natural means generally don't do it in very high EE, and when they do, all of it is mixed together. They're mixed with all sorts of other crystals that would be very hard to work with. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope, uh, Chris, that uh, this was uh, an answer that's uh, useful uh, to you. Um, oh, oh, and, and I can say, I can say, Ruben, that I talk about this in my series on Origin of Life, which which was a thirteen part series, but now we've strung the whole thing together shortened it to nine hours because we had a lot of the introductions and exits taken out and you can just watch for nine hours and you'll you'll you'll, you'll see a very detailed description of this in that right and that's on uh dr tour's uh youtube channel yes um right so uh i noticed that you uh showed us two uh, little uh, pie graphs uh with uh, people's uh ideas about the success of scientists uh, in, in creating life. And um, it appears from this data that people are uh, having overly optimistic ideas about uh, scientific results in this area. Now, um, there's a question from uh, Oliver McGuire, who is himself actually a, uh, uh, a chemist. Uh, he's oh, working in, in, in prebiotic chemistry. And, okay. and, he's, and I'll read this question for you. From watching many of your videos and those of organizations such as the Discovery Institute, that's, uh, by the way, for the other viewers, that's an uh, intelligent design organization, uh, one of the main lines of criticism is that scientists have exaggerated their level of understanding of the origin of life. My experience, uh, this is what uh, Oliver says, is that many scientists within the field are careful to caveat their findings and to note the limitations of their experiments in their papers. However, these details are usually lost when it comes to the reporting of their papers in the media. Uh, thus, how much of the criticism of exaggerated claims is due to communication problems rather than an issue with the science itself? Okay, Oliver. I really appreciate your question, and I'm, I'm glad I'm speaking with somebody who works in this area, a chemist who works in this area. So a lot of the scientists' scientists claims are overblown. I have showed this in my series on, on Origin of Life. You watch that series, and I will, you will see quotes in there where scientists overblow their claims. And I show it clearly. I say, here's what they've done. Here's what they're claiming in the very scientific paper. Now. When they share with the press, the press often, they, they make statements. They make, the press will quote them with statements that go way, way beyond what they've even said in their paper. Because when they say it in their papers, you know, Oliver, they have to be a little bit more careful because this is going to be critiqued by peers. And, and uh, uh, you can only go so far in your paper. Now, they, they've, they've gone farther that, further than they should, but... Uh, um, now, when they quote thing, they say things to the press, they go beyond that because you can see their quotes in the press. And that's in my video series, and I, you, sh you will see actual quotes on this. Then what happens is, and I know this because I work a lot with the press because we, the press writes a lot of things about my own work, is that if you ask them, they will often allow you to see the manuscript before it's published to make sure that they haven't overblown this. And... Still, many, much of this gets out there, and, and uh, uh, there's many examples of this. Now, sometimes you don't have the chance, certain strictures of the press, they don't allow you to see the article and, and, and make any corrections. And then in those cases, you know, it, it, it's, it's not the origin of life researchers' problem. But the origin of life researchers are not without blame here. Now, 
many researchers hype up their work, but the problem with the origin of life hype is that it gets into textbooks and those textbooks then affect generations of students and it's never corrected. You never see the origin of life researchers saying, oh my goodness, how did that get in that textbook? We've got to pull that thing back. And that's what resulted in those generations of people that say, we've created frogs in the lab, frogs, uh, 32% of the people. And, and, and 68% of the people say we've made simple organisms like cells or bacteria in the lab. As you know, Oliver, we're nowhere close to that. But that's how, how, how mystified the public is. And, and uh, uh, the, the, the origin of life researchers are not without blame. I just published an article on the, on the, uh, uh, in the journal um, uh, Inference. So it's a free online journal called Inference. If you just did James Tour Inference, and that article just came out, and I think it was entitled Much Ado About Nothing. And if you just look that up, you will see the actual quotes from, from Devaraj. And what he said to the press uh, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, what he said in his own articles and what he said in the press. And that's right where I go after and I talk about this. I critique his article and just see what they said. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, don't you think that this is a, a, a general problem, not just with origin of life research, that uh, when, when scientists are talking to a lay audience that they are making their claims uh, well, let's say more clear, like maybe even yourself do as well. Would you would you say the same things? Uh, I, I am guilty, guilty as charged. <laughs> I am guilty. Yes, be, be, because because we, 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 we get very excited about these things and we talk about these things. But th there is there's a big problem. There's really a big there's a big there is a big difference on this. The difference is, is uh, uh, when I when I get excited about my work and make big claims about my work, it does not affect a generation of people so that they are utterly lost and confused on this. This has gotten so out of hand that what Jim Tour says about how excited he is about his work and the, and the ramifications of this doesn't get into to textbooks that go from beginning school, which we call first grade, all the way up to graduate school in the university. I, I, have, I have books where they talk about the primordial soup, primordial soup of, of where life came out of that are even in graduate programs in universities. It's that bad. It's that bad. So, so something has to be turned back. So yes, I'm guilty as charged, but, but uh, uh, it's a very, it, it's orders of magnitude different, Ruben. Uh, I see. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, one more question of this same uh, researcher. Uh, he says, um, as a researcher in prebiotic chemistry, I would say that uh, many very uh, challenging problems still exist in the origin of life field. So he's, he's uh, acknowledging that, uh, including some uh, challenges that you have pointed out. We do not yet have an adequate answer uh, to all of these challenges. Uh, this is an active field of research and so this is to be expected. What would you consider to be the key questions that need to be answered for, for you, uh, for you to be satisfied that scientists can say we have addressed the origins of life? Oh, oh, where, 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 what, what was the name of this, this question? What was his uh, name? This, this is the same person, Oliver McGuire. It's st still Oliver. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you, Oliver. So, so, um, uh, okay. W w for example, when I look at John Sutherland's synthesis, terrific. He's, he's an amazing synthetic chemist. But Shapiro, as, as Steve Benner has pointed out, Shapiro has written about this for a long time, but we still continue to do these things. And, and, uh, but what I would like to see, what I would like to see, go ahead and make a carbohydrate. Do you have a carbohydrate? Okay, how are you gonna polymerize these carb? Polymerize a carbohydrate for me without using enzymes to make any, you can even just take one, you can just take D-glucose and polymerize this thing for me. And then deal with the mass transfer problem. How do you envision, how do you envision origin of life starting with I don't know, I'll, I'll give you a ton. I'll give you a metric ton of, 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 uh, of, of material. 
and then think about how you're going to move this down in a random fashion with and have material transfer. Keep uh, deal with the material transfer problem. How do you deal with it? And then it's the whole purification problem. How do you deal with these mixtures without having adequate purification? And you don't even know what you have because there's no characterization. But the deal with the mixtures, how do you deal with these mixtures of things? Where, what is the origin of the information? Where does the informational code come from? You say, well, this was random. It happened to form. Yeah, when that de degrades, how does it ever form again? You, you know, how do these things happen again? So you have the mass transfer problem. You have the information problem. You have the interactome problem. How do you get the non-covalent interactions that are absolutely necessary? Why are there non-covalent interactions, Oliver, in, 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 a, in a cell? Let's, take, let's just take the yeast cell where you have 10 to the 79 billion possible arrangements. Why is that important? Because what happens, Oliver, and I know a lot about this because I work in, the in, 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 in this area of information transfer through molecules, published papers on this. What happens is it's through the non-covalent interactions that information is transferred so that you get information transferring through a cell that's actually happening at near the speed of light. It's much faster than ionic information. You have to have proper ordering between these. This is why you cannot take a cell and dehydrate it such that you dehydrate it enough to remove the structural waters between them and then ever reconstitute that cell. It just will never work again because you've lost the non-covalent interactions that is utterly necessary for life. Where did that ever come from? How did you get that to begin with? That's passed down from life to life. The, 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 the Leventhal paradox of protein folding is another one, but, but you know people understand that, that that is a real problem. How do you deal with this whole thing of chiral induced spin selectivity? If you don't get high yields in your reaction, I'm talking really high yields, a cell can never get, get going. And once the cell gets going, it has to have super high yields because it can't deal with all the exogenous material. I had a grant from the National Science Foundation. And in that grant, we were, we were taking non-biological entities where you take a string and you duplicate it. And then you try to duplicate it again, where you make a mother-daughter duplex and you separate this much like PCR, and then each of this be, each of be, becomes a new mother. Our yields were only about 70%, and that 30% builds up, and poof, it kills everything. How do you deal with these mixture problems? The way nature deals with it is using chiral-induced spin selectivity. Oliver, you got to read about this. This is not esoteric. This is fundamental. How do you deal with this? How do you deal with, with lipids in a lipid bilayer such that you get a non-symmetric pattern you don't have the same lipids inside and outside as you have in every protocell experiment. These are big problems, uh, Oliver. And how do you deal with the stability problem in RNA? RNA, it, 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 if you don't have the right chelators around, these things decompose so fast. Even Jack Sostek himself says you only have seconds to minutes to deal with RNA before it's going to decompose. How do you deal with that? To, in my mind, that takes the RNA hypo hypothesis and boom, it's out the window now. So those are some problems, Oliver. I could go on, but those are some. Well, that's uh, uh, quite a list. Um, I'm sure there could be plenty of follow-up between the two of you. And I apologize to the, to the rest of the audience because, you know, this is what happens when two uh, scientists uh, discuss uh, with each other uh, within their field. Then, well, for many of the ordinary people, uh, it just goes over our heads. Um, so I have a very, very difficult question for you, uh, Dr. Tour. And this is a question by Erica. And uh, she, uh, she says, how would you explain to a layperson very briefly why life could not arise from non-living matter? I could never say that it could not happen. That's exactly what I'm saying. As a scientist, I, I can't say what can happen and what can't happen. Um, uh, it's just that all I've ever said, I've never said it can't be done. All I've ever said is that we are clueless on life's origin. We don't know how it's done. And, and it, it's not even that we are really close. No, we are not close. And we get further away every year as we learn more about the complexity of a cell. So I say we're not close. We're not close to cracking this problem. Uh, but, but I never said it cannot be done because to prove the negative is a very difficult thing in science. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, this is a question by uh, André. Uh, and he says, I've heard that it can be difficult for scientists who are intelligent design proponents. And by the way, we're not claiming that you are. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. But you can answer that for yourself. Uh, it can be difficult for in intelligent design proponents to function in an environment where molecule-to-man evolution is the prevailing paradigm. Um, from censorship in scientific magazines to getting fired. And he wants to know, is this true? And if so, have you ever experienced anything like that? Yes, it is true. And, and uh, uh, I have never pushed that I am an ID proponent. In fact, on my website, under this topic, the first thing it says is, I am not an ID proponent because I don't think that intelligent design is satisfying enough to me to, to, uh, um, to explain the problems that are here. Uh, because because uh, I don't know how to prove intelligent design. I don't know how to prove it. Because we don't have a tool that gives us intelligence. So I, I avoid that, 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 that nomenclature. But, but absolutely, it is a very hard thing when you do not go along with the status quo. It was for Galileo. And, and it was for many scientists, but the scientists that affected the world the most, it was the scientists that took a stance. Now, I started getting into this long after I was already a tenured full professor with a chaired professorship, which means that you know so, somebody has donated a lot of money to the university to supplement my salary. And that's called a chaired professor in the US. So. Long after I was established, I started getting into this, so it's, it's harder to get rid of me. Now, have I lost some grants? Have I been kept out of certain organizations and certain academies because of it? Because of it? Absolutely. Yes, there is backlash when you go against the scientific community. There's absolutely backlash. Uh, uh, if they're younger professors, it is harder than if you're an older professor like me. But if they've done this to me to try to keep grants from getting to me and and you say, oh, you know, this is just conspiracy theory. This is not real. No, this is real. I've had two different people from two different federal organizations have told me in my office in person. They wouldn't even call me on the phone to say this, to say that that I've been excluded from grants. You, can, you, you might as well just stop trying to. Uh, uh, submit your grants there, you're not going to get funded. So these things happen. And by the grace of God, I've funded my, 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 my research many other ways. And I have a bigger group than almost everybody funding it up by other methods. But yes, there is, Andre, this happens. And, and it, it's, but I've, I've not been fired yet. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. Uh, JD asks, what do you think of the clay hypothesis? where clay acts as a kind of substrate for nucleotides. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 if you go back to my Origin of Life videos, I talk about this and I show the data. I don't just talk about this. I show the data. I show the papers. What happens on clay is you can get very short oligomerizations occur on clay, but it's not just normal clay. I go through in this series about what happens. They use vol clay. And they, to get vol clay, so it's a commercial clay, number one, Number two, you take it and you treat it with, with very strong acid-base mixtures and you, you, you treat it in many special ways. Even with this, now you put on the pure nucleotides, the pure nucleotides that are activated and ready for coupling, not just the nucleotide, not just a regular nucleotide, it has to be an activated nucleotide. So in other words, you need a leaving group on that phosphorus that's other than OH. So it's not really a nucleotide, it's now an activated nucleotide. And then when you polymerize it, they're very short. I'm talking about four more, four, four more, five more, six more, that's short. And then when you look at it, it's not the three, three prime, five prime coupling that's in RNA. You get a lot of it is the two prime five prime coupling. So it's no longer RNA. You say it doesn't matter. It matters a lot. What happens when you have the wrong coupling pattern there? When you have the wrong coupling, it acts as siRNA, small interferon RNA, and it shuts down all the, 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 the translation and transcription sequences just cut as a result of this. So the, this whole transcription of information is cut as a result of this. So I don't think much of it because it's highly tuned. And then when you look at it, it's an utter mess. And I show those very papers. So you got to look at the papers and you see this doesn't work. 
it doesn't work. You get the, the two prime, five prime coupling and RNA is a hard, hard problem. Okay, thank you. Um, there has recently been some, um, some controversy over, over the last few months on, on YouTube, uh, a bit of a debate going on between uh, yourself and uh, Dave Farina. And uh, so he has uh, critiqued some of your, well, your criticism of, uh, of Origin of Life research. And uh, uh, he's also responded to your 13 part uh, series. Uh, and it's a very interesting response, I must say, apart from the personal attacks. Um, but among, among other things, he responded to your point that Origin of Life researchers often work under pristine lab conditions. And he points out that there's also origin of life research outside of the lab. And he refers to David Diemer, uh, who does work in uh, hot springs in uh, yes. Yellowstone National Park. And, and quoting from the paper, if I may, um, this is what Diemer writes. Uh, cycles of dehydration and rehydration in such freshwater conditions would promote the assembly of membranous structures in which condensation reactions can produce polymers from dissolved monomers. Uh, so you get polymers of organic uh, compounds. Uh, and then he says, uh, polymerization reactions do occur within the drying film upon rehydration. So when it gets uh, wet again, uh, the polymers become encapsulated within, within membranous compartments so within membranes, to form vast populations of protocells that can undergo selection and evolution. What do you say of that? It's nonsense. I say it's utter nonsense because I've read the papers and I've read the data. So what he did is he buys, he buys nucleotides, he buys them, that are isolated already from cellular natural sources, and he puts these in his hot springs, but he never analyzed the polymers they're from. He just put them and he said they're approximate molecular weight. He doesn't even call them RNA because when you look at them, you can't do it. He never looked at the two prime, five prime connection. He never looked at the base doing the attack. When you don't protect the base, why do we protect the base on, on DNA synthesis? You have to protect the base because the base can act as a nucleophile. Then he never looked at the alcohols that are in there. He never looked at the other things that are in the hot springs that are going to be doing those attacks. He got a bunch of polymeric garbage. He got garbage. And he says he has RNA. And I keep pointing this thing out. It's not been characterized. It's not been characterized. And Ruben, my heart goes out to you. My heart goes out to you because you've been summarily led astray by, <laughs> by, 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 by those words. You really have. Because when you do the analysis on there, he never showed the analysis. Why would he not show the analysis? Because it's garbage. It's garbage. He did. You're doing a condensation polymerization. So you're working under kinetics that are, that, that, that are condensation polymerization kinetics. These are, are, are chain growth kinetics that function under something called the Carruthers equation. Any little bit of impurity, any little alcohol in that hot spring any is going to terminate the growth of this. The, those polymers that he got were utter trash. And then he said that this is in a vesicle and this does evolution. Again, this is what I'm talking about. Oliver, take note. Oliver, this is for you. This is a claim by an origin of life researcher, which was utter nonsense. There is no evolution. There's no RNA in there. He's got a bunch of trash in there. Do the analysis on that. So, so Oliver, look at what's happened to Ruben. I mean, the, the poor guy is so deceived by this. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I know this Oliver uh, personally, and we're certainly going to have some nice follow-up uh, conversations yeah, about yeah, this. Yeah. Oh, oh, so, oh, so <laughs> tonight you're going to have to talk about this. But Oliver, <laughs> Oliver, you know, you're just going to have to take care of this young man. Well. Um, you don't have to worry about uh, me, Dr. Tour. I'm just asking the questions. Uh, this is a question uh, from a certain uh, Mr. T. So, funny name there. Um, uh, this is not directly about the origin of life, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, uh, are there any, is there any evidence that a body could live without a human spirit or, or maybe soul? Uh, 
as it is being taught uh, in the theory of evolution. Just quoting the question here. So, there you is have it. Is there any evidence that a body could live without a soul? Is that the question? That's the question. Um, uh, you, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, <laughs> what is your definition of soul? I mean, some, some people say the soul is, is, is the mind, the will, and the emotions. Some people say, no, the mind is separate from the brain, uh, and, and the mind is, is something external to the brain. So, so Mr. T, that's an interesting name because we, we have someone named Mr. T in the United States who was a, a professional wrestler, and then he became an actor. Uh, uh, but but um, Mr. T, that, that, that's a question that's beyond me because it's getting into the philosophical that I don't know very well because as soon as you mention soul, it's, it's like speaking about consciousness. It's something that's very hard to define. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to pass on that one. <laughs> I understand. Uh, and I'm sure Mr. T is aware, the questioner is aware of uh, who Mr. T is. Uh, I'm sure he's okay. a fan. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I, have, I think I have one more question. Uh, this is a question from uh, Joop Bucher. Uh, he says, and I'll have to translate it live because the question is in Dutch. Um, if, um, if all the chemical uh, uh, compounds that are necessary for life are present in the right uh, amounts, and uh, uh, like, for instance, when, when an animal has died, like a dead cat, that's what he's yes. asking about, uh, we yes. have all those compounds present. Um, yes. Is that enough? for the origin of life and uh, why why doesn't why doesn't life return in 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 a dead animal like that and what is dead and alive anyway yes you know y y i'm going to try to say your name yup bukar <laughs> <Nice try. laughs> <laughs> but, but but um th this is this is an interesting question because when s when a person dies everything is right there Everything's right there. But let, let, let's take it back. It was a person or a cat is very complex. Let's take it back to a, a single cell. There's something we can you know, you know, think about conceptually, the, the chemistry that's there. A single, when a cell dies, can anybody bring it back to life? It's a hard question. And what have we just lost? It's not even defined well. What have we just lost? I asked this question to some colleagues. When, when my kids were younger, I, I, I wanted them to see what happens because very often as a professor, I can just dominate a conversation and, and just take over it just by asking a few very simple questions. And so we had, we had some biologists, some biochemists and chemists in my home. And I told my kids, I said, watch what's going to happen. I said, we have a cell. That cell has just died. What is it that we lost and what would we have to do to bring it back to life? They could not even agree on what it was that was just lost, let alone bringing it back to life. So the definition of life, one, one said it's, 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 it's this, this, uh, um, this ionic potential across, across the membrane. And the other said, no, it's much more than that. It's much more than the ionic potential. So what, what you're asking me, uh, Yap Bukhar, is, 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 a, is a difficult thing. We don't have a good understanding of even what life is in the sense of what we just lost when a cell dies. There's so much complexity. There's so much going on. What is it that just happened? And can we bring it back to life? Now, usually when a cell undergoes apoptosis, which is a programmed cell death, it kind of sets itself up to die and it starts breaking down things sequentially. Uh, if it undergoes necrot uh, 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 ne uh, necrotic cell death, then it's, it's something dramatic has happened. It, it did, couldn't even program the decomposition of its chromatin, and it, it just, 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 just kind of explodes. Uh, uh, and, and so that's necrosis. So, so even cell death isn't, isn't even, even the death event is not that simple. Yeah, <laughs> it does raise the question, of course, yes. uh, where you do draw the line between uh, life and, and non-life. Um, and... And this will be my final question. Where do you draw yes. that line? Is there a certain uh, definition or a set of requirements for life? Because there are these 
uh, autocatalytic uh, uh, sequences of reactions that some oh, people man. would say, well, yeah. th this is something that at least goes in the direction of life. Well, you know, you've been listening to Dave Farina's videos too much. If you think autocatalysis solves this for you, um, Oliver, you're going to have to have a deeper uh, this, talk this is the with <laughs> Ruben than, than, <laughs> than I had imagined here. Because he's, he's I know Oliver didn't didn't say this, but no. Oliver, I'm having I'm, I'm asking Oliver to counsel you. Oh, thank just you so much. Say, just to say <laughs> that there's autocatalysis. There's nothing. It really does nothing. I mean, it, 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 it's it's just so silly. And, and we'll deal with that at some point. But but autocatalysis does not solve this, does not bring your life back to you. It does not. And so so uh, um, uh, where I would define life, I'll just go back to the textbook definition of what I gave you in my slides. You've got to have homeostasis. It's got to be based on a cell. You, you, you've you got to have, and many people will include in this, you've, it's got to be able to evolve. It's got to be able to breathe. These are not my definitions. They are right there. And then I showed you what biophysicists have calculated has to be there to have a cell be alive. I gave that to you. I mean, it's just this list of things. It's not an easy thing. And you can't just say, well, autocatalysis takes care of it. Oliver, help this man. <laughs> well, Oliver is certainly going to have a field day next time he meets me. Uh, <laughs> Well, okay. this, this is the end of the Q&A. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tour, for your time and for answering all of our questions, some, of, some very smart questions, some, some more basic. Um, but uh, thank you for your, for your patience uh, with us and, and, uh, and good luck with all your, your work in, the, in this area and, and your own uh, research areas. If you like the content that's coming out on this channel, I've not monetized it in the sense of advertising. But if you want to give and you want to help support it, you can give to a 501c3 so it's fully tax deductible. And you can see the link below. We'd love to have your participation. And there's several mechanisms by which you could give. Thank you.